from the Maple View Animal Hospital Studios, this is the WHTC Morning News with Gary Stevens and Peg McNichol on 99.7, 1450WHTC and WHTC.com. Welcome back to the WHTC Morning News for this Tuesday, October 27th. Tuesday mornings, we have a chance to chat on a regular basis, weekly basis, with uh, the Republican congressman from St. Joseph, who represents Allegan County in the U.S. House. It is Fred Upton. He's on the other side of our Zoom connection this morning from his base of operations in St. Joe. Good morning, Fred. Hope all is well with you and the family. It's it's good. A little, little uh, freezing rain out there this morning. A little chilly, and uh, uh, I, I was, a couple of my high school classmates, uh, one lives in Chicago, one lives in suburban Detroit, uh, they met in the middle, and they picked St. Joseph. <laughs> and they they showed some pictures of them uh, 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 enjoying the Christmas of a Saturday afternoon on Lake Michigan. And I sort of, I, I, I was tempted just to say, you know, there's a couple of things in St. Joe's you could do besides just go to the Meyer. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, there's a great little pizza place called Silver Beach Pizza. It's in the uh, Amtrak station, uh, right at the base of the cliff there in St. Joe. It's a, it's a great place and uh, out-of-towners love it, as well as people that live here, too. Yeah, there's a lot of good places in St. Joe's to eat, and I certainly, Holly and I certainly enjoy our time when we get a chance to go down there. Let's talk about some of the issues of the day, Fred. And first of all, uh, it seems as if kind of, uh, the Senate was really antsy to make sure that Amy Coney Barrett was uh, uh, nominated and, and the nomination was approved by the Senate for the Supreme Court. Uh, it would be nice if they were going to stick around to be able to get this uh, COVID-19 uh, package that you and the problem solvers are trying to hammer out and uh, have it done before uh, uh, election day. But I have a funny feeling that might not be the case. No, it's not going to happen now, at least uh, before the election, which is really unfortunate. And I, I don't want to finger anyone but here, but uh, politics uh, really took over and the, the election seems to be a little bit baked. And they didn't want to upset that, didn't want something to happen. And uh, tragically, the country loses. It really does. I mean, uh, you know, this thing wasn't over by Easter. It's going to still be here at Christmas. Uh, we have a lot of small businesses. I'm talking to them all the time uh, that are that are hurting. I'm going to be talking to one of our school superintendents uh, this morning, Kalamazoo superintendent. And, you know, they're distant learning now until March. Uh, we need more money for broadband. Actually, I, I think we're going to have some good news on that later in the week. It looks like the FCC is going to go ahead with this auction. We kept their feet to the fire and it could provide as much as a billion dollars uh, a year for broadband for underserved areas. And Michigan, we're going to get a good chunk of that. Uh, we've been working on that for a long time. And of course, we made an announcement just this last week for Allegan and Van Buren counties are going to get millions of dollars for underserved areas. You combine that with what we did in Kalamazoo a little bit earlier, nearly $20 million. But in Kalamazoo, like so many other school districts, it's distant learning. And so it, it's it's hard. It, it's really hard, particularly for those areas that may not have broadband, may not have the devices that are there. It's much harder for, for families to learn. I talked to some of our folks uh, in the Twin Cities yesterday and you know, a lot of kids, uh, they may not be doing that distant learning uh, like they really ought to be. So, you know, we got to make sure that the tools are there. And that's what this broadband legislation is, is going to try and help do. But the thing is, uh, uh, speaking about the COVID-19 uh, stimulus package, I think more what's really submarined everything and, and really torpedoed everything on this is the fact that uh, the intentions are there. The problem solvers' intentions are there to be able to get a, a package put together. But it always seems as if others want to use the package as a Trojan horse to get some of their agenda items. And, Fred, it works both sides. Republicans would do it, and the Democrats would do it. And I think the Trojan horse aspect of this, I think, is the biggest factor why we don't have something right now. Well, that's part of it as well. I mean, I, you know, remember we had a bit huge package uh, last spring. Uh, the speaker came back with, in essence, the same package, over $3 trillion. It was a non-starter from the beginning. It bailed out states like Illinois, New York with their pension systems, had nothing to do with COVID. And it 
it raised that price tag up to over three trillion. That's not going to fly. And the president wasn't going to sign that into law. So why are we spinning the, the windmill uh, uh, trying to get something done that never has a chance of getting to the president's desk? That's why the Problem Solvers Caucus came in, thought we had a reasonable package. It clearly was bipartisan. Every member of our 50 member group uh, supported it. Immediate help for our schools, our hospitals. I talked to a number of our hospitals yesterday. COVID cases are going up. We need another round of PPP for our small businesses. So let's get at it. Let's get it done and, and get a bill to the president that he can sign. Peg McNichol has a question for you from the WHTC newsroom. Peg? The Problem Solvers Coalition is a House group. There's no similar one in the Senate is what I understand, correct? Well, no, that's not quite right. There, there's a larger group that's bicameral called No Labels. Uh, and we have been meeting with them once a month. Uh, we did that before this thing started. We've been doing Zoom calls. There's at least eight senators uh, that are part of that. Again, it's bipartisan. Uh, we've had uh, plenty of meetings. Uh, in fact, over this last weekend, I talked to a couple of you, our senators, uh, not from Michigan. They're not part of this group, uh, but we talked to a number of them. They're on board with what we had to do. We know, know that we got to work together and um, we're hoping to expand both groups in the next Congress, not only the Problem Solvers Caucus, but also the No Labels Group, which is now a national group. Some outside folks are, are helping, uh, I, I guess you could say financially uh, to a degree, but real involvement by Republican and Democrat senators that want to get things done. And many of them, well, Joe Manchin's uh, one of the, this group, former governor of West Virginia, a Democrat. Uh, Bill Cassidy's a member of this, former House member. He served on the Energy and Commerce Committee uh, from Louisiana, a Republican. So we, we've got some good, uh, Tim Kaine, remember, he was ran for vice president uh, from Virginia, a Democrat. Uh, he's part of this group. So we're hoping to expand on that, and I, I think there's real promise to see that happen. Okay, but here's the concern I have that I think many voters and taxpayers have. Why can't this work be done in Congress? That's everybody's job over there. And and it seems like Senator Mitch McConnell is, is the um, blockade in this sense. I mean, he managed to have everybody work through the weekend and make sure that Amy Coney Barrett was confirmed for the U.S. Court, Supreme Court, which is fine. Obviously, you want to get the job done, and if it's going to happen, they need to get it done. But he's got 300-plus bills that he's letting hang fire in the Senate. And isn't the job of what you all do there in Congress is to get on the floor, get in each other's offices, and, and get these negotiations done? I, this is, I mean, nothing wrong with having the outside groups, but the reality is, doesn't it distract from the work you all are supposed to be doing that you're getting paid tax dollars for in Congress? Well, as much as I'd like to change the Senate rules, whether it be the filibuster or anything, I don't have a vote over there. I can only work, I can only work uh, members. They did have a vote last week and it, it, it didn't get the 60 votes. It, it didn't, was, wasn't able to proceed. They had the vote on either Wednesday or Thursday. And so by having that vote stop, I mean, for me, I would have liked to seen that skinnier package, move forward and send it back to the house. I'd go back today, I'd go back yesterday, I'd go back uh, tomorrow and maybe we amend that in the house. Maybe we send it back. That's how the legislative process is supposed to work. But by them not even able to uh, vote for a skinny package, money for schools, money for hospitals, another round of PPP, liability relief for small businesses, it stopped it in its tracks. And that's when they said, you know what? This is the Senate now. The elections in another week. We'll go home, and when we come back, and it better get done when we come back. Uh, we'll, we'll get back to work again. But he he tried twice, including last week. Didn't have the votes uh, to get it done, and um, you know that's <laughs> you, you can't make it up. If you don't have the votes, you don't have the votes. That's another reason to me why they need to change the sixty vote uh, filibuster rule because they had a majority but they didn't have 60 in the, in the Senate. You need 60 votes to move any bill. So barring one, one way of holding elected officials accountable is when we cast our ballots in every election. That is something that's happening Tuesday. Once that's done, what do you think voters need to do and taxpayers need to do to let members of Congress, not just the House, but the Senate as well, let them know what their wishes are? 
I mean, demonstrations are one-time events. What should people be doing so that these 300 or plus bills aren't hanging fire in the Senate, that they well, can support the work of the House? Yeah, well, again, the House members, as much as we'd like to control things in the Senate and frustrations, no matter whether it's Republican or Democrat, uh, we just don't have that ability. But one of the things that we're intending to do as problem solvers is to continue to change the rules of the House to foster more bipartisan cooperation. And we changed a number of things this last year. One of the things we're gonna do in the next Congress, and I've been part of that working group, is to say, you know what? And maybe we can get some reciprocal action. That's the intent of this. If there's a bill that passes in the Senate that's overwhelmingly bipartisan, 80 votes, whatever, it's gotta come up on the House calendar for us to consider and vote on within, you pick how many legislative days. 20, 30, but it's got to come up. And we've had a number of bills that have passed unanimously. You know, we had a bill on uh, for the autos uh, that passed. Every member of the House voted for it. We couldn't get it out of the Senate. They never took it up. So if we do that to their bill, say, look, you pass a bill over there, we're taking it up. Maybe they'll, they'll follow our example and say, okay, you all had a point. You pass a bill with 350 votes, 400 votes unanimously, we're going to take it up too. So that maybe can bring, foster some more cooperation between the two bodies. Look for that to be in a rules change when we assemble come January. And that's what the lawmakers can do, but the general public, they just better hope the lawmakers do their job in that regard and not, uh, you know, they're, they're at the, they're, you know, we, we do the voting on November 3rd and then we vote again on, you know, in 2022. That, that seems to be the case. And the other thing I'll bring a point on to is this. Um, Mitch McConnell is basically doing what Harry Reid did when Harry Reid was running the Senate on the Democratic side. I wish it would have been the, would have, would have been the other way. So well, we'll that's, see. That's why they need to change that 60 vote rule. You know, we have a democracy. So if you have, if you change the 60 vote rule to me, that actually brings about more cooperation between the two parties. So instead of someone saying, nope, you're not gonna get 60 votes and no one's gonna have, you know, after this election, maybe the Senate flips, we'll see what happens on Tuesday, but no side is gonna have 60 votes. So what is it that we can do to foster some cooperation and say, look, if you got some good amendments, work together. That's what I did when I was chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee. I changed the rules of our committee that are still in place today to foster more bipartisan cooperation. Bipartisan amendments go first. And by golly, if you've got a bipartisan amendment, guess what? It's going to win every single time in our committee. Yeah, but all this, yeah, all the efforts trying to negotiate is one thing. Uh, the bottom line is, uh, and you mentioned it, about getting some of the supplies needed, the money needed. You know, yes. that, 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 that's the collateral damage, I'm afraid. You know, I'm running into people every day. Uh, the times are really tough. Uh, they're expecting, you know, we did a stimulus check. You know, it wasn't their fault that their business shut down. It wasn't their fault uh, that the sales are, are still down uh, months later. It was not their fault that, you know, we're not out of this yet. We got to do more testing. We got to get a vaccine. Yes, we're making progress on that. But here it is November, and we still have unemployment that's pretty close to 9% all around the country. Folks need help paying their bills, all these things. And, you know, whether you're a restaurant or a hotel, your, your volume of sales is way down. So how do, you, how do you compensate your employees? How do you keep them on the job when you don't have that? Uh, you know, we talked a little bit about Silver Beach Pizza at the, at the beginning of our show here. Uh, they're, you know, they're doing takeout. They're not doing a lot of alcohol sales because you can't drink and drive. Let's face it, if, if you do a takeout, that's a big chunk of any restaurant's business if they have a liquor license. And if they have one person that tests for COVID, guess what? The whole place shuts down. Uh, so we're not out of the woods. Uh, we need a lot of help here. And that's why I was, as you know, really, and I, I know I'm on radio, I was really ticked off uh, that we didn't stay. <laughs> I could have. <laughs> yeah, I, I got the dump button in case we need it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I was really ticked off that we didn't stay and get the job done and maybe order enough Silver Beach pizza and, and a Diet Coke or something else, uh, to, uh, to, to, to try and get the job done and get it done before the election rather than in a lame duck session, which is still weeks away.
He is Congressman Fred Upton, who joins us most Tuesday mornings um, for a conversation on WHTC Morning News. Next Tuesday morning, I won't be able to chat with you. We got some other programming we have to take care of. But uh, Tuesday night, win, lose, hopefully uh, we'll have a chance to chat and uh, record something and uh, play it back on Wednesday morning. Yep, I look forward to it. Thank you very much, Fred Upton on 99.7 and 1450 WHTC.